All right, you guys, as you can see by the thumbnail, I'm back with another one. And before I get back into this story, the second part of this story, I need to take care of some household business real quick. So first and foremost, I was going to run a live tonight, but then again, I thought, you know, I had second thoughts on, on, on running it because there's really no reason for me to jump on there. I want to try to get content out to you guys. So that's what I'm doing. I will run a live within the next, within the next few days, but I didn't see no point in running a live tonight before I get this video out right here. I want to get the second part and possibly the third part out. So real quick, just to touch on that note right there, I put a, a message in, in the community. Go in the community, check it out. I made it real easy for you guys. All you guys got to do is tomorrow, California time at three o'clock, tap into that link that I left on the community. Tap in, that link right there will bring you to YouTube It'll bring you to the YouTube site of the Insider YouTube site. Once you're on that, that site, tap on the videos, and at 3 o'clock, my video will pop up right there. That's as simple as it can get. It's not that hard to figure out. You don't got to go through this, go through that, go through this, jump through that loop. And, you know, a lot of you are not computer savvy, and I understand that. I try to make it as simple as possible. So just tap onto that link, and then you'll see a line that'll say, you know, videos, dashboard playlist whatever it says tap on videos that's all you got to do you'll see my video pop up right there on the top at three o'clock remember it's three o'clock california time pacific six o'clock eastern so anyways getting getting back to the second part of the story and this is a long story i appreciate everybody that that tapped into the comments everybody that you know confirmed that they know a little bit about this story that they know knew some of the people it helps, you know, for the, the individuals that think we're just putting out false content. So I appreciate everybody that dropped, you know, a comment, everybody that tapped in and gave feedback, good, bad, all that good stuff. So let me make this clear as well. When I tell you guys these stories, the way that it's conveyed to me is the way that I try to get it out to you guys. But you got to understand, this is a long story. It was an hour and 15 minutes that it took for this story to be told to me. So. You know, I try to be as concise and as accurate as I can, but I'm human. I'm going to make some mistakes. I might get a name jumbled up. I might get a location, you know, uh, uh, that's that's wrong. There's there's going to be mistakes. But what I want to do right now is clarify a few of the errors. Nothing that I said in the last video changed the, the you know, changed the, the concept or the trajectory of that story. The story remains the same. There's just a few minor things like names or locations, things like that, that were off. And, you know, some of you knew some of the individuals that were involved. I want to clarify, you know, some of the things that some of you said in the comments about these individuals that just wasn't true. So anyways, and understand this, I'm not trying to get into a debate with anybody from SoCal, from Southern California. I would look stupid trying to teach you guys your own history or debate your own history. You know, that's that's not my thing. It's not my place. That's not what I'm doing. The individuals that are telling me these stories, they're the ones that are making the corrections. They're the ones that are saying they touch on this, touch on that. This is incorrect. You know, this right here, make sure you clarify that. So it's not me. You know, again, I would look real stupid trying to clarify Sureño history, Mexican mafia history to a lot of you guys that live out there in Southern California. These are cats that, you know, were, were plugged in. So just trust and believe these are good, accurate stories. The, the, the stories are accurate. And the sources, these sources right, sources right here, you know, I, I'm, I'm real confident about the information that they have. Just trust me on that. So for starters, I want to say that this is a correction that, that somebody had made in the comments about where Sana was from. Sana was not from F Troop. For anybody that was saying that Sana was from F Troop, he was not from S Troop. Sano was from a gang called Second Street Sharks. These guys really ain't active no more. I don't know if you know. I would go as far as saying that they're defunct, but they're no longer. They're not really out there doing their thing. There might be some some individuals that are still claiming Second Street Sharks, but they're they're no longer active like they were when Sana. You know that's that's Sana's neighborhood. Also, for those of you that knew Charlie Chats from Clover, and you know, apparently claimed that Charlie Chats was killed in his lowrider. That's not true. 
Charlie Chats was killed in his Chevy pickup, his Chevy S10, early in the morning. Also, for those of you that knew Charlie, he started a car club in East Los called Dino's Bomb Squad. Also, Charlie had a bomb and he had a 1987 Monte Carlo luxury sport. The Monte Carlo apparently belonged to his dad. Also, some of you in the comments were either asking about Sporty or had alluded to an individual named Sporty asking if this was the same Sporty from White Fence. This is not the same Sporty from White Fence. This Sporty that I'm talking about, like I said, he's from East Side Long Beach. He's from Longo. So he's not from White Fence. And although this same Sporty that some of you were referring to, he was a Mexican Mafia member. However, he was hit in Corcoran. Also, I don't know if I mentioned the meeting that Sana held in El Salvador Park, the, the legendary meeting where, you know, he tried to, he implemented some edicts to stop the drive-bys and to try to unify all the street gangs out there. Sporty was not at that, he was not at that meeting. Some of his cousins were at that meeting, but Sporty was not there. I don't know if I said something or somebody misconstrued that, but it was in the comments and, you know, that's another correction. He was not at that meeting that Sana held in, in El Salvador Park. Also, the Sporty that some of you were mentioning from White Fence, he was hit in 1997 in Corcoran by Daryl. Also, just to touch up on Daryl, the, the Daryl that you guys mentioned from White Fence, he got hit in 97 in Corcoran by Daryl from Ontario Black Angels. Not the Daryl that I keep confusing from Artesia, Tecalote, not him. There's another Daryl that is, is a good homeboy of, of Turtles. They're both from Ontario. And just to wrap this up on Daryl, in the, in the first part of this story, I told you guys that, that Artie from King Cobras and Daryl from Artesia were running the yard out there in Corcoran the same time when all this was going on with Sporty. Honest mistake, it wasn't Daryl from Artesia. It was Daryl from Ontario Black Angels, not Artesia. Also, some of you were asking about that youngster from Bakers that was supposed to go back in and deliver that wheeler to Lalo from Lomas. That youngster was from Bakersfield. Some of you asked if he was from Baker Street in Orange County. He was from Bakersfield, not Baker Street in Orange County. Also, on another note, a few of you mentioned that F Troop had a lot of pull with lipstick bail bonds. That might be true on some level. However, Sporty's the one that had, that was his company. He's the one that had all the pull with, with lipstick bail bonds. It was Sporty that was getting everybody out through lipstick bail bonds. Sporty did get some F Troop guys out on bail, but he did it as a, as a favor for Tigre. But Sporty was never the type to look for credit. So it's very possible that they might have thought it was Tigre or fellow F Troopers that got them out. But it was actually, it was Sporty. There's another bail bonds that also got caught up in all this. And this individual was a close friend to Sana. His name was Jack Gleason. He ended up getting caught up in the black flag indictment behind him trying to facilitate wheelas or information in the county jail. Apparently or allegedly he was using his bail bond status to, you know, to navigate in the jail and to, to facilitate those messages. Also, the incidents that took place in CRC in the early part of the story took place in 1996. And also, Sporty wasn't in prison in the 80s. I should have clarified that. But what I meant was that it was a different time. The politics were different. The players were different. It was a different environment. Also, when I said that Sporty, when he came to prison, you know, he was functioning like they were in the 80s. I didn't mean that he, he was doing time in the 80s. What I meant was that prison was a different environment back then. The politics were different. The players were different. When he came in in the 90s, they were still functioning like they did in the 80s, in the early 90s. It changed like towards the end of the 90s, towards the new millennium. <laughs> what I should have said is that he just, he wasn't part of the Pepsi generation. He was part of the, kind of like the old school, that era. The same era that I came from. One other thing that I misspoke on was that CRC was never a reception center. That's just where Sporty ended up. He landed in, in CRC at that time. And, you know, again... When Sporty went to the hole, he went to Chino because they didn't have a hole in CRC. So that's why he ended up in Chino. Also, another clarification, Mike Boo was not one of the nine carnales that was in Chino when Sporty landed there with Turtle. Mike Boo wouldn't come into the story until later when he was contacted by Sporty in Fresno to follow up on Mondo's status. So he was not in Chino.
This next clarification also involved Mike Boo when Sporty got in touch with Mike Boo about the directive that was supposed to go to Lalo from Lomas. So when I told you guys about the youngster that paroled, the one that paroled with that kite from Thumper, and I told you guys that Sporty and Tigre were going to send that youngster back in under Mike Boo's orders, and that Mike Boo wanted him sent in with a parazo, some carga, and you know, the, the wheeler, the one time that was supposed to go to Lalo from Lomas. I misunderstood the, the part about the parazo. And that right there is attributed to my lack of understanding the Spanish in the correct context. Because the way I heard it, it was I heard parazo and I heard carga in the same sentence. So in actuality, when parazo was mentioned, it was mentioned in the context of an ounce of carga. <laughs> I know, man, I know. So what Mike Boo was saying was to take, you know, a pedazo of, of carga, an ounce, and to wrap it around that one time, wrap it around that, that wheela, and send that in to Lalo from, from Lomas. So there was not no pedazo. There was not no plastic pedazo. That youngster just had an ounce of carga and the wheela. Again, you know, these things, they're, they're, they're not that important. They're insignificant to the story. It doesn't change the story. So, you know, they're, they're, they're small errors, but I wanted to correct them nonetheless. So the biggest fumble I made with all these all these mistakes was probably when, when I, I misunderstood the name of the Yavero that got killed in Corcoran. His name was not Tigre. His name was Firme. However, when, it was, when I heard the name, that's what it sounded like. It sounded like Tigre, but it was Firme. Firme from Riverside. So it wasn't Tigre. Also, in the first part of the story, when I mentioned that Sporty went to hit Firme, that, you know, he got it two other Sureños that were loyal to him about assisting him with that hit. Those two individuals, one of them, one of them was Blanco from Puente, and the other one was, was Smokey from Hazard. He would try to take credit and say that he was the one solely that killed Firme. That's what he was telling everybody else, but that wasn't true. The other thing about Charlie Chats from Clover, a lot of you apparently knew him. The other thing about him is that he handled Artie from King Cobra's affairs out on the streets and in prison for about 10 years. He was the one that was basically handling all Artie's affairs out there. However, as some of you know, Charlie Chats was killed in 2013. However, after Artie's crew fell, Charlie Chats was killed early one morning on his way to the methadone clinic in El Sereno. Somebody drove by and lit him up with the Uzi on Huntington Drive. He ended up getting hit several times and he died right there. Anyone that wants to verify this, because some of you in the comments have different stories or heard different ways of Charlie Chats getting killed, you guys can pull the LA Times and you can see the article right there. There's a picture of his white truck, the Chevy S10, and you can see the bullet holes in the picture. Charlie James Alvarez, that was his name. So if you pull the article, like I said, there's a picture right there, you can see it. So this is where I left off in the first part of the story. So when I left off, I was telling you guys that the feds, whenever... Whenever they're going after somebody in a big investigation, like an indictment where they're going after a street gang or they're going after the NF or the Mexican mafia, what they do is they put a tag in the system. And this is for all law enforcement that you know might pull you over or somebody that runs your name. And this tag, basically what it does is it red flags you. It red flags you and it tells them you know, to leave you alone, to leave you alone, to not arrest you, that, you know, you're, you're instrumental somehow, some way in their investigation, that they need you out there on the streets. Maybe you're the only one in contact with certain people. And if they take you out of the equation, then they can't bust these other individuals. So, you know, it's, it's, it, that's what it's called. It's called, you know, putting a tag in the system. Well, like I said, in the first part of the story, the feds, they put tags in the system on both Sporty and Tigre. And when this youngster from, from Baker's got busted, he got busted with, with the with the high wheeler. He got busted with the carga because he was with that female and he was all he was all gowed out on that shit. When he got busted, Anaheim PD, they, they went in the system and they obviously, they seen the tags. But for whatever reason, Anaheim PD and Santa Ana PD, they have, like, they hate each other. They, they hate each other. It's almost like they got their own light, lightweight gang feud going on between these two. Anaheim PD. So they seen the tags, but they were like, man, fuck these dudes. You know what I mean? They completely disregarded it and they ended up arresting Tigre. So after Anaheim PD, after they after they arrest this youngster from Bakers, they, you know, and they see the tags in the system, 
they still they go to they go to Tigris pad and you know they arrest him, they find him with you know they find a bunch of dope. There's like eighty thousand dollars worth of cash. There's dope. There's all kind of contraband, and you know they raid his house, knowing that still he was flagged in the system. Meanwhile, the feds they're on their way to the police station. They seen the whole bus go down. They're they're pissed off. They're livid that you know that Anaheim PD disregarded those tags and that they basically sabotaged their investigation. So Diggit is in the county jail. The feds, they're on their way down to the jail. So they get to the jail. They want to talk to Tigre. So all this was premised on that youngster getting busted with that kite and, and the carga. You guys got to remember, this kite was a straight kill kite. It wasn't coded up. It, you know, it was wrote in haste. It was something that was just struck up real quick. They packed it up, wrapped the carga around it, sealed it up, and gave it to the youngster. So this was a kill kite. This was a conspiracy to commit murder. So, you know, they got they got down to the county jail and they probably ran their scare tactics on, on Tigre. The feds get down there and they tell them, they're like, check this out, man. We, we got this youngster. We caught him with this one time. You know, it, there, there's a there's a kite that we know that you authored, that it came from your hands. And, you know, you're caught up in a, in a conspiracy to commit a murder. This right here is a slam dunk case. You're done. The youngster, he already gave you up. He's talking and he already cut a deal for himself. So you're in a lot of trouble. You're in hot water. So right off the bat, Tigre, he requests protective custody. He tells, you know, these, these FBI agents, he's like, you know what? I'll cooperate. I can bring down the Mexican mafia. And, you know, he basically tapped out. So off the rip, Tigre, he requests protective custody. He tells these agents, you know what? I can bring down the Mexican mafia. And he checks in. He checks in, whatever happens, they throw some kind of deal at him. He's down there brokering the deal. He knows he's in a lot of trouble. He's not going, he's not feeling going back to prison. So they strike up a deal. They probably came at him with the proffer agreement or whatever it was, and he agrees to cooperate under the condition that they drop the case. And, you know, he goes out to the streets and he works as an active CI. So that's what he does. Now, when they cut him loose, what they did was they doctored his paperwork or they generated some paperwork, basically saying that, you know, the certain charges were dropped, but at the same time that he would, you know, he posted a million dollars bail. You know, it's pretty crazy that they went as far as generating some some fake bail bonds paperwork that illustrates, you know, that, that he had posted a million dollars bail and, you know, that certain charges were dropped. They basically made it look legit because they knew that when Diggity got out, that people were going to want to see his paperwork. You don't get caught up you know, after they raid your house with a bunch of dope, a bunch of guns, and you're out that same day, that right there, that right there is, is suspect. You know, people are going to ask questions. They're going to want to see your paperwork. How the fuck you get out when you just got busted with all that dope, all them guns, all that money? Like I said, he had like $80,000 worth of cash. He had a bunch of bunch of dope. He had some guns. So they caught him slipping. So when Tigre, when he gets out, obviously, you know, he calls, he calls sporting. He's like, Hey bro, I'm out. You know what I mean? They, they, I, I post a bail that, that youngster, that youngster told on me, bro. So sporty, he shoots over there. Obviously, you know, he's glad that, that Tigre is back out. He was thinking that, you know what, I'm going to have to run everything. The homie's busted now, you know, he's out there scrambling to get everything back in order. And then he gets a call from Tigre. So obviously Tigre tells sporty, he's like, man, this fucking kid, he told him, you know, now they're trying to slap a conspiracy to commit murder on me. So, you know, I post a bail. I'm out. So he shoots over there. I imagine he probably wanted to see the, the, the paperwork. If not, I'm sure they, they pushed it on him like, hey, check it out. Look here. I bailed out so that he can dispel any suspicion that he might be over. I mean, that's anybody knows that. You know, if I would have been thinking, that, I would have been like, man, everybody's going to wonder how the fuck I got out. You know, how do you get out when you got when you get raided by a task force, they don't come at you like that unless they really got something. So I imagine when, when Sporty went over there, Digger probably had the paperwork in hand and was like, hey, check it out, man. This is this is what happened. And made up some some crazy story about how he ended up, you know, landing in the county jail and he fell asleep on a on a on a bench and had to use a roll of toilet paper to, you know, take a nap until the bail bonds came and, and, and bailed him out. So, so at that point right there, Sporty, his main focus is like, where's this fucking kid at? Where's this youngster at? Let's go kill him. Let's go take care of it right now. 
at least if we get rid of them, you know, it'll solve some of the problem. You're not going to have nobody that's going to testify against you in the case. So let's go take care of it. But Digger is acting kind of, you know, he's acting like he's not really tripping on it. It's not really a priority for him to go after this youngster. And it doesn't make sense to Sporty. Sporty's like, you know, why wouldn't he be on board with something like that? You know, this dude just told on him and he don't want to go whack him. So it didn't it didn't make sense. That's when things started, you know, red flags started to go up and Sporty started to trip. But still, you know, they've been running together for a while. Sporty didn't have any reason, you know, to be suspicious about Tigre telling. There was no reason for him to be suspicious about it. So it just kind of got brushed off. So, you know, at this point, Sporty and Tigre have been working together for a long time. But, you know, now that Tigre got busted, he caught this case, you know, he leads Sporty to believe that, you know, he's like, I'm hot right now, bro. He's like, you know, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to scale on back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick back for a little bit, let the heat cool down. And so Sporty, he tells him, he's like, hey, bro, he's like, don't trip. I got it. He goes, you know, you're on bail right now. He's like, just go ahead and lay low. He goes, I got this. But the thing that really throws Sporty off is that Tigre, he tells him, he's like, hey, I'm going to have this other individual from my neighborhood. I'm going to have him step up and, and, and take my spot until, you know, things kind of cool down a little bit. So this right here, it really threw Sporty through a loop because, you know, this individual he was referring to, this was somebody that the old man, Sana, he despised. He hated this dude. And then come to find out later, Dire hated him himself. But he wanted this dude to take his spot because really he was setting him up. You guys got to remember, Dire was already telling at that point. He had already checked in. He was cooperating as a CI. But this individual he was referring to, really what he was doing is he was setting him up. He was you know, making sure that this individual was going to get gaffled up with everybody else. So Bethel from Eastside Bowling, he sailed up with Sana in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. They've been cellies for a while, and Bethel, he's due to parole. So he's getting ready to parole. When he paroles, Sana gets a message to Sporty and Tigre to pick him up at the airport. Pick him up at the airport, get him set up, help him out. You know, he's, he's he just got out. He was my celly. And, you know, Sana told him to take care of him, make sure he's set up with everything that he needs. So at around this same time when all this is happening, Sana, he starts hearing from his people out on the streets. He starts hearing that that Mondo Moreno, Mondo was, was stepping on his toes. He's out there in his territory. He's collecting money. And that Mondo was basically trying to take over his area out there on the streets. So, you know, the old man, he's, he's fuming. He's furious. He's got smoke coming out his ears. And... So all this is happening at the same time. Bethel's getting ready to parole. Sana hears that Mondo's out there, you know, making moves. He's out there shaking people up on the streets, collecting money, and that he's basically trying to take over his whole territory. At that time, when all this is going on and Sana hears about Mondo on the street and what's, what he's doing, Sana gets so mad that he jumps on one of the one of the prison's phones, one of the, the recorded phones, one of the blue phones, like you see in the county jails or the prisons or state prisons. He jumps on the phone that he knows is recorded, but he don't give a shit. He jumps on the phone. He's so mad. He throws, you know, caution to the wind against his better judgment. He jumps on the phone. He calls Sluggle from F Troop. He tells Sluggle, hey, I want this dude dead and everyone who fucks with him. Everyone who fucks with him, I want all of them wiped the fuck out. I don't give a fuck. He's not family. He's not related to me. He never was. Handle that shit. You know, when Sana, when Sana makes this phone call, Sluggle, he's probably like, man, what the fuck? You know, the old man, he's tripping, man. You know what I'm saying? He just called me. He just said what he said on the phone. He probably was like, hey, you know, it's like, Sana, man, the, you know, the phones are recorded. He's like, man, you're going to, you know, going to get us both caught up. He, he might probably didn't say nothing to Sana. Sana was so pissed off. He probably just was like, yeah, yeah, you know, hey, I, I, I'll take care of it. Uh, I'll take care of it, old man. You know, I got this. Don't trip. Whatever he told him, though. I'm sure Slugger was probably like, fuck, you know what I'm saying? Knowing that they recorded shit like that, knowing, you know, who, who Sana was, I'm sure he was probably tripping. And he had reason to, because that one single phone call right there start, stirred up a shit storm. The feds, obviously knowing how much control, how much power Mondo has, you know, out there on the streets, they heard that phone call. That started a major investigation. It it basically it woke up the beast. When he made that phone call and they heard what he said, you know, they knew he was getting reckless. So that right there, it got sluggle hot. 
it got Bethel hot, it got Sana hot. They started watching. They knew they were going to be out there making some moves. So that's what ended up happening. Really, what it all came down to is Sana didn't want to share. He's a thousand miles away from his territory, but it, it didn't matter. Sana had that area up under his control for years. That was his area, his territory. So, you know, the way the way Sana was probably looking at it was, you know, he had been in control of that area for years. A lot of the older C's, the older Karnas went when they have a position and they've had it for years. They become, you know, they 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 end up, you know, developing a sense of entitlement. They feel like it's theirs for the duration. They don't want to share with nobody. And, you know, the way he's probably looking at it is, you know, this this youngster got some balls to come up into my area, encroach on my territory and start, you know, moving and shaking in an area that, you know, I've, I've been running for years. So, you know, Sonny didn't have no patience dealing with Mondo. He just wanted him dead. And he was willing to sacrifice some of his own people in order to make that happen. So that's why he made the reckless call. That's why he started making these moves. You know, he's old, probably got blood, high blood pressure. And, you know, that's what he did without even thinking about it. He jumps on the phone, makes this phone call to Slogan. And now, you know, he blew the spot up. The feds are all over him now. Now, now Sana is basically putting it out there that Mondo is not a C. He's like, he's a false prophet. He's out there, you know, claiming to be a Karna when he's not. He's like, you know, this dude's an imposter. He's got to go. So, so what Sana does is he knows that, you know, when it comes to issues like this, when it comes to, to somebody that he knows will take care of, of a problem like this, he goes and he gets at Sporty. He knows that Sporty will clip Mondo, you know, without a second thought. Sporty's somebody that's been loyal to him. Sporty's a hitter. He's done shit for him in the past. So Sana gets in touch with Sporty. He reaches out to Sporty and he tells him, he's like, hey, I want you to kill Mondo. Kill him. You know, he's an imposter. He's, he's you know, hard candy, on site. He tells him all the good stuff. Whack this dude and get it done. But at the same time, you know, Sporty didn't have a problem with sending Mondo to Brazil. He didn't have a problem with doing that. He never had an issue when it came to whacking people out there. You know, he had done it before. And, you know, Sana, he knew it. He knew that, that Sporty would get it done. And like I said, Sporty was willing to do it. But at the same time, Sporty wasn't, he wasn't a dummy. He'd been around long enough to understand politics. He understood mafia politics. He he kind of felt like, you know, well, he knew that this issue that, that Sana had with, with Mondo, he knew it was all personal. He knew that it was all over money, that it was personal, and that Sana was probably even willing to sacrifice him just as long as Mondo got killed out there. It didn't matter. So what Sporty did was, he ended up getting in touch with, with Mike Boo. He reached out to Mike Boo, who was, again, out there in Fresno. And, you know, he shoots out there and he gets in Mike Boo because he knows, you know, Mondo, his last name is Moreno. So, you know, Mike, Mike, his last name is obviously Moreno as well. And all his brothers, they're all Carnas, all of them. So, so Sporty, he wanted to make sure that, that Mondo wasn't related to Mike Boo. He was basically covering his own ass because at the end of the day, Sana... He didn't give a fuck whether Mondo was made or not. He didn't care just as long as he was dead. He might not have cared, but everybody else would have. And Sporty knew that. He knew that if he whacked, he whacked a made member, that he was done. And knowing how politics work, you know, Sana might have spoke up and said something. But at the end of the day, Sporty still would have been done. So Sporty goes out there. He sees Mike Boo. He gets at him. They hook up. They link up out there on the streets. So Sporty gets with Mike Boo and he tells him, he's like, hey, this individual Mondo Moreno from Hard Times is, you know, is he related to you? And Mike Boo, you know, he tells him, he's like, nah, he's not related to me. He's not, that, that guy's not related to, you know, none of my family, even though he's a Moreno. But he was like, nah, he, he's not related to me. But, you know, Pelon, one of his older brothers, happened to be one of his padrinos. For those of you that don't know, a padrino is somebody that basically raises their hand for you. It's somebody that that raises their hand and and basically says that, yeah, you know what? I think this individual is, you know, a good prospect for recruitment. I'm gonna go ahead and raise my hand for him, you know, and, and put my stamp on it. That's what a padrino is. So although Mondo wasn't related to Mike Boo. That's all Sporty needed to hear because he knew at that moment right there that Mondo was legit. 
because if Pelon was one of his padrinos, then that obviously meant that he was a made member. So, so at the time when Sporty asked Mike Boo about Mondo, he didn't tell him why he was asking. And Mike Boo didn't ask either. That's as far as the conversation went. Mike Boo didn't have no reason to ask why, you know, he wasn't suspicious. That's all Sporty wanted to know. I'm probably, I'm, I'm sure that Sporty went over there and, you know, when he had the conversation, he probably asked him about something else. They probably kicked some other things around to make, you know, to make it seem like that wasn't the only reason why he was coming out there. That probably would have raised suspicion. Like, okay, why'd you come all the way out here to ask about, you know, this individual Mondo? So it was probably just one of the many things that, you know, he asked Mike Boo about. He probably slid it in. You know, Sporty was a shrewd individual. Like I told you guys in the early part of this story, throughout his entire career, Sporty had probably interacted with about 30 different Mexican Mafia members. So he was around a lot of them. You know, when he got around different ones, they would, you know, educate him and you know, he would absorb a lot of the, the, the education that they would give him when he was sold up with, with Turtle. He learned a lot from Turtle. And there was a lot of other individuals that were responsible for grooming him up. So he was a sharp individual. So at that point, after Sporty goes to Fresno and he kicks that around with Mike Boo, you know, he still got that issue that he still needs to deal with. Sana is still waiting for him to whack Mondo. So what Sporty does is he doesn't tell Sana that he's not going to hit him. He tells him, you know what, I don't I don't have a problem with sending this individual to Brazil. I'll do it. He's like, but under one condition, you send a made member with me. Again, Sporty was 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 covering his own tracks. That's what he was doing. He was making sure that he was covered. You know, if there was another Mexican Mafia member present while he was killing Mondo, you know, it might not have justified it. And he might he might not have got clear for it, but it would have fell on that other that other Mexican mafia member as well. So that was a step that he took to cover himself. Now, Bethel from Eastside Bowling, he was the one that was supposed to go with Sporty to whack Mondo. They had talked about it. You know, they sat down. They talked about it. They both knew that Sana wanted Mondo whacked, and you know, Sporty told him, he's like, hey, I told the old man, I don't have a problem with whacking this dude, but, you know, you're going to be present when I do it. So, you know, just to wrap up this part about recruitment, you know, in the feds, when three Mexican mafia members raise their hand for you, the final vote goes to Colorado, ADX, to the commission. After the commission gets it, they either stamp it or they don't. If they stamp it, then you're official. From that point, you're official. You know, the other thing about Bethel that would actually end up catching up with them later is that, you know, he was given he was given clearance to put a, a, a mono on his chest. You should be looking at the picture, an actual picture of his chest with that tattoo. So, you know, before the, the stamp of approval even came back from the commission, Mondo was al already wearing that badge. He already had the black hand tattooed on his chest. So spinning forward now. So Bethel, you know, he sailed up with with Sana in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. Sana gets a hold of, of, of Sporty and, and Tigre and he tells him, he's like, hey, you know, my celly, he's coming home, take care of him. They set him up, you know, they go and pick him up from the airport. And up until that point, apparently Bethel had never even been to OC. He'd never even been to Orange County. You know, he, he'd been down 24 years. He just pulled a 24 year bid. He gets out. He was up there with, with, you know, the old man. So, you know, they embrace him. They embrace Bethel. He gets out, he's got the, the black hand tattooed on him, and they take a liking to him. You know, they, they thought he was a cool individual, so they embrace him. And like I said earlier, Sporty, he set him up with everything he needed. Guns, car, money, dope, everything he needed. So, you know, they're out there working with Bethel now. They're on the streets, and at some point, Bethel ends up meeting Gloria. Gloria was a female that had been Sana's secretary for decades. She was somebody that that facilitated his communication. She, you know, anything that he needed done, she was the one that took care of it out there on the streets, basically his mule. She basically took care of all Sana's affairs. So, you know, Beto, he gets out and at some point, I guess he meets Gloria. Obviously, you know, he was sold up with, with Sana, so Sana probably gave him her, you know, her address and said, hey, you know, when you get out, go over there and touch base with Gloria. She's a good friend. She's the one that handles all my affairs. Touch base with her. Well, <laughs> Bethel goes over there. He gets it at Gloria. And the next thing you know, they're cuddled up in bed together. So he meets Gloria. And now, you know, Sporty can't get him out the house. 
Sporty can't get him off of Gloria. He's cuddled up everywhere. You know, he's running around, taking it or dinner. He's whining and dining her. You know, Sporty had on at least 15 different occasions tried to contact Bethel about, you know, taking care of Mondo. You know, and each time he would call Bethel, Bethel would tell him, hey, bro, he's like, I'm at the movies right now, or, you know, I'm, I'm, we're at dinner, or I'm at a concert, or I'm at the bowling alley, or I'm at the fair, or wh whatever they were doing. He couldn't get him away from Gloria. He just kept on making excuses. So, you know, Sporty, there's nothing he could do about it. He was trying, but it was Bethel that was dragging his feet. That's why it didn't get done. I see you back there, boy. Meanwhile, on the other hand, what Bethel was trying to do is he was trying to manipulate the situation. He was trying to get Sporty to go ahead and whack Mondo. And then, you know, he wanted to say that he was there with Sporty when it happened and that he took part in it. But, you know, Sporty, again, Sporty wasn't no dummy. He wasn't going for that. He was like, hell nah. You know what I mean? First and foremost, I'm not going to stick my neck out there. You know, this is another supposed Mexican mafia member that he could have took a back seat when all this came out. He could have backtracked and been like, hey, I wasn't there. I didn't clear it. I don't know. Cutthroat politics. And Sporty, I'm sure he had seen it all at that point. So even though, you know, Beto was trying to get him to do it himself and, you know, he wanted to say that he was there and that he participated and he wanted everybody else, you know, to believe that Sporty was like, nah, it's not going to happen like that, bro. What you need to do is you need to separate yourself from that hyena and you need to come with me so we can take care of this. The old man is going to be furious. You know, we've been out here for X amount of time and it's still not done. And hey, bro, it, it falls on you. You know, you're the one that it ultimately falls on. You know, the cool thing about it is that Sporty, he could have whacked Mondo. He could have did it easy because all of Mondo's pistoleros, all of them were from Santa Anita. They were all Sporty's boys. All of them, all the, all the cats that he surrounded himself with we're all loyal to Sporty. So, you know, that would have been easy for Sporty to track his movements and to get to get a drop on him. Easy. But he still knew that if if he clipped, if he clipped Mondo without either having Beto there or if he just did it on his own, that that would basically be the end of his career. Like I said, he knew how politics work. He's seen cutthroat politics. And when you've been around it long enough, you know, the number one rule is to always protect your own ass. That's the number one rule, because when you don't do that, that's always the one time that you end up getting caught up. So, you know, Sporty wasn't going for it. In fact, later on, when the war would really kick off between Mondo's faction and Sana's faction, all the cats that that Mondo had around him, his pistoleros, all his main his main hitters, they all backed away when they found out that Sporty was, was gunning for Mondo. So, you know, a lot of his hitters, they ended up falling off. A lot of Mondo's main hitters, you know, they backed up. You guys got to remember, these guys from Santa Anita, they were loyal to Sporty to a T. I mean, I told you guys earlier in the, st in the story as well that some of these guys actually had Sporty's name tattooed on them. And again, I know it's weird, but when you got somebody that's that's fiercely loyal to you, you know, they've shown you time and time again that they got your back. And, you know, that they're the kind of leader that, you know, when, when they're up under your direction, they follow your direction because they want to. I've told you guys before, I've talked about good leaders and bad leaders. Good leaders, you know, they, they take care of their manpower. They don't abuse them. They get down in the trenches with them and, you know, they make them feel that they're part of the team. That's the thing about Sporty. He was a good leader. He took care of all his people. And that's that right there. That's that's how you build loyalty. So these were the type of guys that, you know, they followed Sporty, not because they had an obligation, but they followed Sporty because, you know, they wanted to follow him because they believed in, in him as a leader. So when all this kicked off, you know, these guys that were from Santa Anita, they all backed up. So, again, after Sporty gets the confirmation from Mike Boo and, you know, after he continues to keep getting the runaround from Bethel, you know, he's still stuck knowing that, you know, Sana, he's the one that reached out to Sporty. At the end of the day, he's still on the hook for whacking Bethel. So, again, after Sporty gets confirmation from Mike Boo that Mondo was legit, and at some point, you know, after it becomes clear that Bethel doesn't want to participate in killing Mondo, 
Sporty was smart enough to know that at the end of the day, he was still on the hook for killing Mondo because Sana was the one that reached out to him. So he had to account for why it wasn't happening. He had to communicate something back to the old man and tell him, hey, you know, either Beto, he's dragging his feet. He doesn't want to get, you know, he doesn't want to get caught up or Beto, he just, he doesn't have, he's not taking no interest in helping me or whatever, whatever it is, or that, you know, he's over there with Gloria or whatever the reason was. He needed to let Sana know something because Sana was expecting something to happen to Mondo. You know, the other thing that, that Sporty finds out later, while all this is going on, he's getting all these directives, he's getting to run around from Beto. He ends up finding out that Sana was actually one of Mondo's padrinos as well. He's telling people that, that Mondo isn't a C. He was one of the ones that raised his hand for Mondo. And now, you know, he's saying that he's an imposter. He's not, he's not a C and he wants him whacked. One of the other reasons why Sana was furious with Mondo was because, you know, Mondo agreed to kill Musclehead from Del High. He agreed to get out. He agreed to kill him. He gets out. He doesn't know where to find Musclehead. He has no idea where to locate him at on the streets. He don't know where he hangs out. None of that stuff. He gets in touch with Sporty. Sporty knows Musclehead. So Sporty, you know, he basically, he leads him to him. He's like, hey, this is where you could find him. This is where his family lives. This is where he's at. He's always in this area right here. You'll probably catch him right there. He gives him all the information he needs. But Mondo, he takes no steps towards killing Musclehead. He doesn't do nothing. And that right there, that obviously upset the old man even more. You know, the other thing that was crazy about it was, is that Musclehead had been no good for at least like 20 years, for a long time. Well, don't quote me on that. I don't know if it was 20 years, but it was a long time. And Sana had actually ran into Musclehead on the streets several times himself, but he never took any steps to kill him. You know, he always used to let him sell his dope, collect his money, run around out there on the streets. As long as he stayed in Delhi in his, in his neighborhood and continued to, to do his thing right there, Sana didn't really care. It wasn't a priority for him. And, you know, a lot of people knew that he had ran into him several times. This was something that was well known. But now he was pushing the issue, and it was Mondo's responsibility to whack him. From there, things just escalated. They ended up finding out that Mondo ended up going to YA for killing two Mexicans. And that at the time that that happened, Mondo was actually claiming to be a crip. That right there just kind of sealed the deal for him. So after all this comes out, Mondo, when he gets busted, he ends up going into witness protection. That's basically it for him. He checked in. So he's done. So when all this is going on, they got, you know, Tigre out there. He's working as a CI. They're getting other information out there from, from other people that are cooperating. They're, they, you know, they got surveillances going on. They got wiretaps. They, they got video of, of different cats meeting each other out there. They're tying the conspiracy together. While all this is going on, the feds are building their case. So, so Tigre, Beto, Sana, they all get snatched up. And this is all part of the black flag indictment. So they get caught up and all the main players from F Troop, they all get caught up. They snatch all them cats up and anybody and everybody that was close to Sana, they get hit with this, you know, with, with an indictment. Everybody gets wrapped up and bam, they're all caught up now. Meanwhile, Sporty, he's at a hotel. He's out there. He's with the Heine and, you know, he's with the Heine. He falls asleep that night. In the morning, he wakes up and there's like 80 missed phone calls. There's 150 texts. And he's like, the fuck is all this? So he starts going through his texts. He starts, you know, listening to his voicemail. And there's people asking him, hey, bro, are you cool? You all right? You safe? Is, you know, what's going on? Is, is everything is everything straight? They were basically trying to find out if Sporty had gotten snatched up in any of the sweeps. They wanted to know if he got caught up in that first wave. So, you know, Sporty, he's tripping. He's like, what the fuck? You know what I mean? What are they talking about? So, Saturday in the morning, he turns on the TV. It's all over the fucking news. All over the news. Black flag indictment. They got Sana's picture up there. They, they got Beto's picture up there. They show Tigre. So, Sporty's watching the news, and, you know, he's listening to him talk about the case. And they make mention of two outstanding suspects that are still at large. And when, when Sporty hears that, he's like, fuck, you know what I mean? That's got to be me. There's just no way. This was an investigation that had went on for almost eight years. It was an eight-year investigation. And although Sporty was locked up for seven of those eight years, the shit that he done out there, he was like, you know what? 
all this shit that I've done within this last year, there's no fucking way I'm not one of those two, you know, suspects that are still at large. One of them's got to be me. So he hears about these two individuals that are outstanding. And at some point he finds out that he's not one of the two that were outstanding. They ended up getting snatched up. They found the other two individuals they were looking for. And, you know, he's puzzled. He's like, how the fuck did I not get snatched up in this indictment? Everybody that I've been working with close to, they all got caught up and I didn't get, I didn't get snatched up in this. It don't make no sense, but you know, he'll take it. He's like, fuck, I don't know. He's like, maybe, maybe I wasn't out long enough to get caught up in this shit. He can't figure it out, but he's still, you know, he's moving with caution because he still feels like, although I didn't get caught up in that first wave. Anybody that's familiar with indictments, the superseding indictments, their ongoing investigations, you know, you understand that there's probably a second wave. Sometimes there's a third wave or, you know, there's always people that are getting added to the case. You know, they, they get amended into the case. So, you know, he's tripping now. Everybody's gone. Theater is gone. You know, Sana got caught up. Bethel's gone. And now he's out there. So now he's out there by himself. But you know, he knows he's still got to keep pushing. He still has a responsibility out there. He's still got obligations. Just, you know, just because everybody got caught up doesn't mean that he stops doing what, you know, he's been doing. And this is all that, that Sporty's been doing for the last 30 years. The last 30 years, all his life has consisted of is running for the Mexican mafia, generating money for them, you know, working with them. When he goes back to prison, you know, he's around them. He functions with them. So this is all he knows. It's all he does. You know, so he gets in touch with this attorney and this attorney tells him, hey, you might want to be careful, man. This is a continuing investigation. It's a superseding indictment. They're still snatching people up. You know what I mean? Keep your ear to the ground. You might want to you might want to be be careful, you know, doing whatever you're doing out there. Dot all your I's, cross all your T's. Keep your ear to the ground because more people are, are likely going to get caught up in this investigation. And you know how it goes when people cooperate. Other people start getting implicated and it just snowballs. It gets bigger and bigger. So, you know, I'm sure that there was some relief. I'm sure Sporty was, was you know, relieved that he wasn't part of that first wave. But again, he was no dummy. You know, he understood how the law worked. So he was trading easy. He knew that more than likely he was going to get snatched up. So at some point, Sporty, he finds out that they had had his phone tapped. And, you know, he knew that at some point that they knew that he was next in line to step up. So he knows he's hot. But again, like I said, you know, he knows he's still got his obligations. He still got to keep on doing what he's doing out there. He still, you know, he still continues to do what he's been doing out there. You know, making money, selling dope, collecting taxes, doing what he's been doing. At that point, that's all he's worried about. And that's all he's focused on is just generating money. So eventually he ends up getting caught up on a state case. It's an unrelated case. I want to say it was for you know, it was a dope case or something like that, but it's completely unrelated to the indictment. He ends up catching a state case and now he's in the county jail. He's in the county jail. He gets there. And obviously, as soon as he gets there, he resumes, you know, running the county jail. He's got the Yaves again and, you know, he's in charge of the jail and he gets an attorney visit. His attorney comes up, the female attorney, and, you know, she comes up and she's got some guy with her. So his attorney comes up and, you know, it's a female attorney and she's got some guy with her. And, you know, when, when Sporty comes out, he sees her and he sees her with this, this individual and he don't recognize him. He don't know who he is. So when he comes into the attorney visiting room, you know, he sits down, he asks his attorney, he's like, hey, who's this? And, you know, his attorney, she tells him, he's like, listen, she's like, he's an FBI agent. She's like, just, just listen, I just want you to hear what he got to say, you know, I don't want you to say nothing. I just want you to hear what he has to say. And, you know, Sporty goes off. He's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? You know, I don't fucking talk to these people. He tells her, why would you put me in a cross like that? Why would you bring an FBI agent to the county jail and pull me out? You know, you can get me caught up like that. And the attorney's like, listen, I just want you to hear what he got to say. Calm down. This is, you know, this is for your best interest. I'm only doing this for your best interest and you'll understand why. So Sporty's like, you know what? I don't fucking talk to these people. And he looks at this guy and he's like, he's like, he's like, what, what did you come up here for? So the FBI agent tells him, he's like, check this out, man. So the FBI agent, he's like, look, he starts laying out this whole case. He starts laying everything out for Sporty. 
conspiracy to commit murder, conspiracy to commit murder, conspiracy to commit murder, 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 conspiracy to commit murder, murder. Like he just lays out all these murders, all these conspiracy to commit murders, gang enhancements, conspiracy to traffic narcotics, witness intimidation. He lays everything out to Sporty. And, you know, when Sporty hears that, he's like, okay, so fucking what? He's like, and that's that's what you came up here for. He's like, man, I already know I'm caught up. You know, I, I, I knew I was caught up and I knew I was done when, you know, I caught this case. He's like, I'm not tripping. If that's what you came up here for, you wasted your time and mine. So after this FBI agent, after he lays out about 50 cases on Sporty, you know, Sporty tells the man, so that's why you came up here for? And the FBI agent, he tells him, he's like, well, you know, that's that's not entirely the whole reason why I came up here, but that's that's part of it. And Sporty's like, well, what else, why, why else would you come up here? So the FBI agent tells him, look, we know Beto's tied in with Sana. You know, we know that you were out there running around with Tigre. He's like, we obviously know about a lot of things you were doing out there. But, you know, here's the thing. When we went and we raided Beto's house, you know, we found some things that were that were very interesting that you might want to might want to know about. So Sporty's like, you found something interesting. What are you talking about, man? He's like, what did you find? He has no idea what this what this guy's talking about. You know, he's still, he's just irritated that this individual came up to the county jail. He's irritated with his attorney for, for bringing him up. And I'm sure he was uncomfortable knowing that he's sitting there with the FBI agent in the county jail, you know, when... You know, he's got to worry about people walking by, seeing him and, and all that good stuff. So so he's like, you know, when we searched Bethel's house, we found these letters and he hands he hands Sporty the first letter. So when he hands Sporty the letter, he tells him this letter right here was authored by Champ in ADX, Colorado, who's who's on the commission. Then he tells him this letter right here was written to Bethel. And he's like, look at the date. So Sporty, he looks at the letter and he's reading the letter. He sees the date and it's all starting to kind of come together. So Sporty starts to read the letter and Champ tells Bethel, he's like, look, you're not a carna. The commission shot you down already. You know, you were put up to be a made member a year ago and two brothers said no. He's like, stop doing what you're doing. So after Sporty reads that letter, the FBI agent hands him a second letter. So Sporty starts to read that letter. So the second letter is dated a year before the first letter. So when he reads the when he reads the first letter, it's basically it, it reiterates the same thing that the first letter, you know, the same thing that the first letter was saying that he wasn't a C, you know, to, to stop doing what he was doing, that, you know, the commission had already shot him down, that he wasn't going to be a made member. And it, it basically said the same thing that the first letter said. But this was dated a year before the first one. So obviously, Beto knew that the entire time he was out there. So the agent hands Sporty a third letter. And the third letter is actually from the gang unit in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. And that letter was addressed to Sana. It was basically confirmation that Sana had received the same letter. So Sana also knew about this. He knew long before that Beto wasn't a C, that the commission had shot him down. But Sana didn't pass that on to Sporty. He didn't pass it on to Tigre. He didn't tell nobody because, you know, his main focus was to have Mondo killed. That's all he wanted was to was to kill Mondo. He was obsessed with killing Mondo, even if that meant sacrificing Sporty, Tigre, and some of his squad. So the fourth letter was a letter from Champ basically telling Beto that he was like, look, you and everybody that's on your team, everybody that you work with, all of you guys are on the hard candy list. As soon as you guys hit the feds, you're done, including Sporty. So this is something else that Beto knew about. He knew about it, but he didn't say nothing to Sporty. He didn't he didn't mention it to nobody. So Champ, he basically tells Bethel, you know, he assures him in the letter. He's like, look, all the all the USPs have been notified. They've all been notified about your status. They've been notified about your crew status. And as soon as you guys land in any one of these federal prisons, you guys are done. Obviously, when Sporty reads this, he's devastated. He's crushed. Everything that he's been working for for the last 30 something years, it's all, you know, it's all come to an end and it's cutthroat politics again.
He's sitting there. He's devastated. He reads the letter like three or four times just to make sure that he actually understood what he thought he, he just read. And, you know, it felt like all the, the, the life had just been drained out of him. You know, when you when you're dedicated to a criminal organization like this, when you've been around guys that, you know, you're willing to die for, guys that you would kill for, that right there, you know, when you've been a part of a criminal organization like this and you've been around guys that you're willing to kill for, guys that you know would kill for you, you're out there taking, you know, life chances and your career comes to an end like that and you're a true believer, you're somebody that put all your loyalty, you put all your cards into, you know, this commitment, you know, this life that you've committed yourself to and that you find out that basically that they put you on, you know, the, the bad news list that, you know, you're marked for, for death, it's devastating. You know, some of you might not understand it, but the same grief, the same level of devastation that you would feel if you lost a family member or something like that, that's the same way that you would feel, you know, when you get you get hit with something like this straight to the gut. And that's what that's what Sporty was feeling. You know, I'm sure that Sporty was probably sitting there trying to wrap his head around all this, trying, you know, to digest everything that, that that's going on, thinking like, man, you know, everything is going to change now. You know, everybody that I thought was loyal to me now, they're gunning for me. It's it's a lot to take in. And there's no doubt in my mind that he was sitting there feeling devastated, probably didn't know what else to say to his attorney, probably told, you know, his attorney and this dude to get lost so he could collect his thoughts. You know, I'm sure he was devastated. You know, I'm sure it wasn't like, you know, that he heard this and was able to continue on with this interview. He probably told him, you know, to kick rocks and, you know, he probably wanted to go back to his cell and, and think about it. For Sporty, I'm sure that that was a life altering moment. So, anyways, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and end this right here. There's still another part three to this story right here. I told you guys it's a long story. There's a lot of moving parts to this story. You guys will find out what happened with the rest of this. But you know, this is what happens. You know, all these stories that I've been telling you guys about these stories that you know that you hear about a lot of these guys that are dedicated to to a T. They're dedicated. You know, they, they give up everything in life for this organization. They, they put everything they have in it. They invest everything. They, you know, put their kids second, put their wife second, put their family second, only to end up getting wiped out, you know, because of, of, of bad politics. You know, Sporty did everything he was supposed to do. You know, Sporty did everything he was supposed to do there probably wasn't nothing different that he could have done. He covered his ass when he needed to. He, you know, whenever he got directives, he followed through with those directives. He was a different kind of leader. He had people that were like religiously loyal to him. Again, you guys remember, he carried around notebooks with him. Notebooks that literally had, you know, if you were on his team, if you were a part of his team and you got busted, you went to the county jail, you know, he carried these two notebooks that had, you know, all his members, all their wives, all their, their kids' names with all their birth dates. You know, if they were married, he had their anniversary dates in there so that, you know, when they, when they were locked up, he would go over and drop presents off for the kids. He would go and make sure that your wife had whatever she needed to make her feel, you know, like she was getting something special on her anniversary. That's going above and beyond what a you know a good leader does that's that's a different kind of leader that's on a different level and because of that these guys were were extremely loyal to him that's how you define real loyalty right there you know what he was doing anyways i hope you guys enjoyed this this part of the story the second part there's a third part i'm going to try to get that out in the next day or two i'll try to get it out tomorrow we'll see what happens I don't want to let too much time go by. I want to I want to keep the story flowing. So I'm going to try to get it out to you as soon as possible. Again, for those of you guys that are interested in watching that interview, the insider interview, tomorrow, California time, 3 o'clock, go into the community. On that last message I left you guys, that link, it's got one link in there. Go in there, hit that link. That link's going to bring you to the, the, the homepage, Insider Inc.'s homepage on YouTube. When you get to that page, you'll see videos, tap on videos, and that's where the interview will be right there. It's simple. 
you know, don't try to Google it or, or try to find it on YouTube because it's it's complicated. Trust me. Just go through that link that I gave you guys in the community and that'll make it easy for you to find. Anyways, with that being said, I'm going to try to put out episode 73 of Inner Demons tomorrow. If I don't get it out tomorrow, I'll get it out the following day. Tomorrow is the day that that interview comes out. So I might not do it tomorrow, but I'll try to get it out to you guys on the next video. I hope you guys enjoyed this story again. Drop your comments. You guys have been dropping a lot of good comments. If you know about some of this stuff, go ahead and, and put the feedback in the comments. That opens up a lot of good dialogue. Anyway, with that being said, this is your boy B, and I'm out.